Welcome to Kelly Minds Her Manners, a podcast about real estate and entrepreneurship with a twist. Here's your host, Kelly Robinson. It's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me on Kelly Minds Her Manners. For everybody who's watching and listening, Rich Cohen is the author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, including Monsters, Tough Jews, and Sweet and Low. He is also the son of famed top negotiator Herbie Cohen, whose life he wrote a book about called The Adventures of Herbie Cohen, World's Greatest Negotiator. He is also a contributor to Vanity Fair and co-creator of the HBO series Vinyl with Martin Scorsese, Mick Jagger, and Terrence Winter. He grew up in Chicago and now lives in Connecticut with his four sons. So, yeah, so you, you have quite a, quite a career, quite an impressive career. And it only looks like a career from a distance. While I'm living, <laughs> it seems like one thing after another. Um, no, I mean, you've accomplished so much, and you had such an interesting childhood. I was listening to some of your previous interviews about growing up with your dad and your family. And um, it sounds really interesting. Your dad seemed like a real character. And it seemed like you really got a a good learning experience from from him and and just your childhood in general. Well, I feel like my I was a victim of kind of a social experiment is what it feels (laughs) like. I'm the youngest in my family. And every single thing my father told me was helpful. Every single thing my sister told me was helpful. Every single thing my brother told me was a lie. So I got used to being lied to all the time. My brother told me when I was a kid that my favorite food was spaghetti. At one point, he just told me that spaghetti was cow veins. In case oh, I God. So I stopped <laughs> eating spaghetti. He told me ketchup was illegal in Colorado. We were in Colorado, so that was embarrassing. So I became a very cynical, shrewd person as a result. But the good thing is I had my father, the negotiator, to balance it with his many positive messages and helpful aphorisms. Yeah, and and it's so interesting because your father did have so many positive messages, but he also had a little bit of um, not a pessimistic view on life. But he he said that you know being happy or being content was not necessarily a good thing when it comes to drive, right? He said that dissatisfaction breeds progress, and when I told him that I was unhappy, he said, "Good." Happy people never have accomplished anything. <laughs> it's unhappiness that makes you. Now, he's 89 years old, so maybe his feelings about this have tempered a bit. He's, he's a, a become a little more, more mellow with age. But he always had this idea that you should be driving to do something. You should be active. And the positive message was he told us never to be intimidated by power never to be intimidated by people who sort of try to lord their education or their background over you. And that as long as you're still alive, you're still in the game. That's, that's good advice. Yeah. And did you take that to heart and with you through, through your career? I think so. I mean, I think that um, I have more, I have more trouble with little problems than big problems. When there's big problems, I can usually rally when there's little problems, I get hung up. So my wife once said, I, uh, Uh, can eat a lion, but choke on a fly. And that's basically how I go through my life. (laughs) I think there's definitely some truth to that. I think when you have a really big issue, there's the adrenaline just kicks in and you start to figure it out. Whereas little problems are just annoying and you kind of want to push them to the side. You want to make everything perfect so you can relax. Yeah. You got to do one more thing, one more thing, and then you can rest. And there's always going to be one more thing to do. That's true. Yeah. So that at some point you realize that this is an illusion. It's like when you're driving on the highway and you see the water up ahead, but there's no water there. <laughs> there's always going to be something else, you know? Yeah. Even if you get what you want. I found this out as a Chicago Cubs fan, which is the Cubs won the World Series and I'm still not happy. Yeah. Even if you, even if you get what you want, it's not really what you want. So it can never really make you happy. <laughs> yes. I actually, I heard you mention that. Um, and on another podcast about the about how it wasn't as satisfying as you thought it would be when they won. It was 2015, 2016? 16. 16. First of all, I was too old. So it, it should have happened when I was 12 or 15. <laughs> yeah. It happened when I was like 50. So <laughs> there's that. And the fact that I don't live and die with baseball the way I used to. But I was already sort of 
developed. My personality was developed, which this is a thing my father warned me against. He begged me not to be a Cubs fan because it said a Cubs fan will have a bad life because a Cubs fan will accept losing as the natural end to all human endeavor. <laughs> so even though the Cubs won in 2016, my personality had been formed in a kind of pessimistic view of grand efforts. Oh my God. Seasons. That's hilarious. What led you to become a writer? I mean, what, and, and what was the moment you fell in love with it? And was it before that crazy teacher that you had in college? <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm, you're a born writer, kind of. Not a born writer. You're somebody who tells stories and somebody that stuff seems like it happens to. So people, when I was a kid, people always say, stuff always happens to you. And it wasn't that. It was just that I was always very good at observing what was going on around me and breaking down people into groups and sort of looking at everything like a bit of an anthropologist as I went through my own life. And that's my father does that too. And I think that's an inherited thing. And it makes you kind of a storyteller. So I ended up writing when I ended up writing because the opportunity was there. But um, I think that since I was a kid, I was kind of interested in telling stories and, and writing. And so, and I'm still telling stories I was telling when I was 15 years old. I mean, if you look at my books, it was all, it's all stuff I was interested in as a kid still. There's not any change. I was telling stories about my father and trying to figure out if he was leaving me valuable wisdom or if he was just speaking while half asleep <laughs> since I was a kid, you know, like, does that really mean something important? Is that something I have to think about for years? Or did he just say that because he just got out of the shower? I can't really <laughs> decide which. That's hilarious. Your, your father, um, I mean, he, he was a top negotiator. He did hostage negotiations even, correct? I mean, he was. Yeah, what's amazing is sometimes some of what he says, I, I, I can't believe it's true, you know? Like, because it was, and since his book came out, I've been getting emails from all these cops from around the country who he trained the SWAT teams how to negotiate in hostage holding situations. FBI, he helped set up their behavioral sciences unit that studies serial killers. He was with the CIA and the State Department and on the start talks. And one great thing about this book is all these people have been writing me because my father's thing, it's negotiating and how to do business and how to just but it's like a philosophy of life. And he, he touched a lot of people's lives. Like he made their lives better because he gave them a different way to look at every day. So I've been hearing from these people. They've been writing me through my publisher and I've been forwarding those emails to him. And I think it's very satisfying to him to find out that at now at 89, my mother died. We're all kind of old, me, my brother, and my sister. But my father feels like he actually did something with his life. And that's like a great thing about this book for me, the best thing. That's awesome. That's really, that's, that's really awesome. And as a negotiator, he was always more interested in negotiating for other people than himself, right? Like you, you had mentioned something about that, you know, him feeling like it was important to be somewhat detached in a negotiation. Well, I always said without realizing he was kind of a Jewish Buddhist. He didn't even realize it because he's preaching detachment. And he always said the key to success in life and business is to keep said in a very funny way in a thick Brooklyn accent, he's from Bensoners, is to care, but not that much. <laughs> and for that reason, he'd say the one person you're a bad, always going to be a bad negotiator for is yourself, especially if you're negotiating with your own family, like your kids, because you care too much and yeah. you lose perspective. And he would say you mistake, you know, the, the, not, he's always says not just, the tree for the forest, but the knot hole for the tree. You're like pressed up against life too closely. Yeah. So always he said that you were the worst negotiator for yourself because you're, you care too much about the outcome and it means too much to you. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, it's definitely true in real estate. You don't ever want to get attached to the outcome. Um, yeah. and, 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 there, and he, he also talks about negotiating from a place of empathy, which um, another a negotiation expert that I that I've you know read whose books I've read, Chris Voss also talks about those. I'm sure you know who he is. Um, also talks about uh, negotiating from a place of empathy. And your dad also mentioned something about not needing to be the smartest, most intelligent person in the room during a negotiation. Why is that? Well, he'd say in a negotiation, dumb is better than smart. And when people come to you and they think they have all the information, he would always say. 
he would always say, and I do this, I've been doing this up uh, this summer in this situation. I mean, he would say, I don't get it. And it's totally disarms the other side. Like they prepare this whole thing. I don't get it. I'm not so smart. Can you explain it to me? And he always said the, the most important words in negotiation are who, huh, and what. I wanted to ask you about that so badly. I can't say it as good as somebody said. You put them all together. You write them on a blackboard. Who, huh, and what. And you put them together. Who, huh, what. And he said, people actually will help you. The other side will help you. And his thing is that people will, his thing is not just negotiating the best deal, but negotiating a deal that will last. As I'm sure you know, in real estate, I had this experience with him a couple times where you get a great deal and it falls through because it's not right. It's not right. sound. Right. So, yeah. So to, for it to last, he said, people have to be part of the process and then they'll try to make the process a success because they feel like it's part of their creation. So if they yeah. help create it, they're going to help to make it go through and last. And you see yeah. this in politics now all the time, which is one side does it, the other side torpedoes it. Yeah. So you get your victory and two years later it gets undone. So that's what he meant by empathy was you have to put yourself in the position of the other person to understand their needs and their wants and even their language. Otherwise, you're speaking two different languages. You don't under, you're saying, we don't understand what they want. You can't move them. And one of his favorite quotes was always from an Arthur Miller play, The Price, which is to understand the price, you have to understand the player. You might be offering somebody something they don't care about. Yeah, and they think true. your offer is very generous, but they don't care. It's something they don't want, you know. So uh, I, I and I think that he felt like you get the other side talking, you find out what their needs are, what their wants are, and then you can ultimately work your way to a deal. And his phrase that he sort of popularized was win-win. He sort of took that from academia and put it out in the world. And his idea was so much of stuff is zero sum, which is for me to win. Me to feel like I won, I have to feel like the other side lost. Yeah. And he would say that is not going to work because basically you've just planted the seeds for the next conflict. Both sides have to feel like they got a lot of, but not everything that they wanted. And both have to walk away feeling like I did the best I could do in this situation. And if you do that, the deal will last. And I'll tell you a real estate story. Yeah. Which was me, which is we were, we were living in Manhattan, my wife and I with three little kids and we, we sold our apartment, and we were renting our own apartment. And the new people that we sold it to were putting pressure on us to get out. And we were looking in Montclair, New Jersey. It was like the height of the market. Everything we offered, there was a bidding war. We kept losing. We were like out of time. And I said, let's just pick a place we can live with, not even like our dream place, and give them the asking price and end this. And I did it. And my father said, that's a mistake. You're not going to get that house. I was like, what are you talking about? They, they made an ask. He goes, because they're not going to feel happy that they got their asking price. They're going to feel like they screwed up. They didn't ask for enough money. They're going to feel like they lost money. And they're going to look for a way out of the deal. And that's exactly what happened. The deal fell apart. And as a result, they ended up moving to Connecticut instead of New Jersey. Yeah. No, it's, you know what? It's absolutely true. And, I, and I've, I've dealt with this a lot over 17 years where the seller gets their asking price from the first person who bids. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, we didn't ask enough money. But if they were to get a little bit less, they might actually be happy because they felt like they had to put something into it. So. That last point you made. So like his whole thing, like I always couldn't stand the negotiating that part of it because he did it for us. And it just seemed like a big hassle. I just wanted to get to the end. And he was like, no, you have to go through this whole process, not because you're trying to get money out of people, because the pro there's a reason for the process. It's what make everybody feels like they got everything out of the experience. So every time you make a counter offer, you're signaling, I can go up a little more, but this, is, this isn't the end, yeah. but this is close to the end. You're getting near the end. And that just prepares the other side mentally. We're getting everything we can. We're getting everything we can. So they might wind up with less money, like you said, that if somebody just offered the asset price, we're going to feel really good about it. Exactly. That's what we want. Yeah. And at the same time, you don't want to go back and forth too many times because that weakens the relationship between both people on each side of the right. deal. Yeah. There's a moment. Another thing that he always says is that 
like the key to life and negotiating is you have to live with ambiguity. Mm-hmm. And that's really hard. So like, you don't know if you're going to get the house. Right. You have to be willing to not get the house. Yeah. And right. And that's uncertainty. And that's stressful. And he so said, people have a hard time living with that stress. So what they do is they rush it or they overpay. Yeah. Right. So he's like, you don't have to always live with ambiguity. You can get to certainty quicker, but you'll pay for it. Yeah. And if you can live with ambiguity, you'll do much better. It's true. And there was there was a story that you talked about where your dad had negotiated a great deal on, on the house and, and your mom went and got another house for twice the price behind his back. And he seemed to handle it well. But 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 how did he really feel about that? Well, it had to do with my grandfather, too, which is my grandfather invented the sugar packet and sweet and low and had all this money. My father never got along with him. We were ultimately disinherited. My father negotiated this deal on this house in Highland Park, Illinois, actually. And um, my grandfather came into town. My father then left town and said, I don't like this house because he's able to sort of bully my mother <laughs> and got her to buy this other house in the next town that was more expensive. And, and basically... He was pissed. I mean, pissed enough that he was still talking about it when I, years later. He still talks about it now. So he was, you can't even, don't want to get him started on the subject. So yes, he was very angry, but I think he realized that for some things are more important than others. And in this case, the health of his marriage required him to sort of just live with it, which uh-huh. is like, you gotta, that's his big, you got to know when to hold him. You got to know when to fold him. He always quotes Kenny Rogers on that. So Basically, he realized that the marriage in this case yeah, it outranked the <laughs> soundness of the deal. But it put him back financially, too, because he ended up owning two houses at the same time. He always talks about that they couldn't sell the other house. He couldn't furnish the house because like, they put all their money into the house, you know? Yeah. And um, uh, for me, it was great because they would let me draw on the walls and stuff of that house. You know, I thought it was paradise. But they explained to me that's only because we were out of money. Well, you know what they say, happy wife, happy life. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. That's what he, my mom, the parent is my, he always told the story. He would say, my mother said, the kids have already met the neighbors. They've already made friends. And the dog has already made a friend. <laughs> that's so funny. So what, what are one of your dad's quotes that's the, the most unforgettable that you take with you in everyday life? Maybe if you're second guessing yourself, what makes you pause? He says, the big picture, you know, he's saying that this is just the thing you're worried about today is just a walnut in the batter of life and just a blip on the radar screen of eternity. So when I get all caught up in the moment and attached to some little problem, I think of that every day and it helps me calm down. That's awesome. There should be a book just about Herbie Cohen quotes. A lot of them are confusing. Like he always said, a nose that can hear is worth two that can smell. (laughs) And he'd say that people would get real quiet and then they start laughing. But what he means (laughs) is it's better to be unique. You know, it's better to be weird and be different. And you should try to be like everybody else. You should accentuate your differences. Yeah. Another fun thing about my father that you notice if you met him is he, he wears two watches. And I always ask him, why do you wear two watches? And he always says, because a person with one watch believes they know the time. <laughs> but a person with two watches realizes they can never be sure. <laughs> Does he set them at different times? I think over time, watches just go to different times because there's yeah. no perfect timepiece, which is his point. Everything is subjective. That and is he also so always says... We see things not as they are. We see things as we are. And that's, and I can remind, I can throw his own words back in his face when he gets mad at me about <laughs> something. I can say, you lost perspective over this, you know? And the others say, believing is seeing. That's another one of his favorite things. Love it. Absolutely love it. He said that negotiations are everywhere in your personal life, that you are basically negotiating in every aspect of your life with every person in your life. Do you agree? Yes. And actually, that's one of the great things this book did was at that time when the book came out in 1981, people were intimidated by the word negotiation. It wasn't as commonly used as now. It seemed like if I were to talk about actuarial tables or carry loan interest or something, it just made people uncomfortable and they were intimidated by it. And he sort of said, you don't have to be intimidated. And what's more, I don't even have to teach you to negotiate because you already know how. 
Mm-hmm. You're doing it every day with everybody in your life. You just don't know you are. But if you realize what you're doing, you can become better at it, understand it. And it's key to all of it is you got to approach it like it's a game and you'll play looser. You'll live longer and you'll actually be more successful. Mm-hmm. So one of this, I just heard this from recently because I'm still, he's still telling me new stuff, which is the best natural negotiators without realizing it are kids. Kids negotiate naturally. You don't call it that. You call it kids being a pain in the ass. <laughs> kids negotiating. So an example he goes, if you ask a 15-year-old kid what they want for their birthday, they'll say a car. Okay. You're not getting them a car. Mm-hmm. It's a ridiculous ask. But what, the, what they've done is they set the bar so high, they started with a big offer. They've raised your expectations. So you're going to wind up getting something more than you wanted just so they're not disappointed. <laughs> That's such a good point. <laughs> His own book, he started with me having a tenter, temper tantrum in a restaurant because I hated to go to restaurants. And he said to take me to a restaurant 10 years after that, <laughs> which is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> That's so funny. So now you're also involved in, um, in television. How did, you get, how did you get involved as a co-creator uh, of Vinyl? Well, I worked for Rolling Stone magazine when I was young and I did a bunch of stories about the Rolling Stones later wrote a book about them where I traveled on the road with the Rolling Stones That's so awesome. I knew Mick Jagger I knew him and then uh I wrote this book called Tough Jews which was about Jewish gangsters in Brooklyn again these are stories my father told me about Jewish gangsters in Bensonhurst and I was such a big fan of Goodfellas the movie that's the best movie I've ever seen and I wanted to write a gangster story, but I feel like they'd all been written. And I'm like, well, they're all about Italians. I'll write about the Jews that we're partners with. And um, somehow that book got to Martin Scorsese, who loved it, gave me a, a blurb. And then he and Jagger were working on this project together, and they asked me to write it because I knew both of them. And I wound up in this relationship with Mick Jagger, Martin Scorsese, and it eventually became the TV show Vinyl. It was a long process. It took years started out as a movie, it became a TV show, but that's how I got involved in it. And then subsequently, every now and then I've helped, you know, work on a TV show. And um, it's interesting for me because I grew up not reading books. I grew up watching television. So that's, I feel like that's my native home is yeah. 1980s TV shows. And screenwriting is much different than book writing. Are you? Yeah, well, I actually wanted to be, I wanted to make movies. In high school, I used to just make a lot of movies with my friends and stuff. And again, I went to my father and I asked him to send me to film school. This is at the end of college. And he said, I'll make you a deal. I'll send you to film school after you go to law school and medical school. <laughs> if you come to me, you're a lawyer and a doctor, then you can go to film school, which was him. He thought film school was stupid, basically a waste of money and a waste of time. It's just his expense and her thinking. So... I ultimately became a writer because I realized what I was interested in was not film so much as telling stories. Mm. And if I wanted to be a writer, all I needed was paper and a pen and I didn't need any money for film school. Yeah. And he really wanted you to go to Yale. They have a great conservatory program there. (laughs) Yeah. Well, he dreamed of one of us going to Yale and none of us did. And he said to me when I was older, he said, if you had done better, you could have gone to Yale. And I said, you know what? I know a little more about the world, but I learned is if you had done better, I could have gone. To <laughs> the joke it's is true. I went to this high school. Of, yeah, I went to a high school in Winnetka, Illinois called New Trier. Wow. And um, they were doing the alumni book and getting everybody's school for like the phone book. And they called and they got my father, not me. And they said, we're just confirming that your son, Richard, went to Tulane. And he said, no, he went to Yale. And they said, oh, That's no, so we funny. have down Tulane. He said, well, you have it down wrong. They went to Yale. And they said, uh, we're pretty sure you're wrong. He said, if you're sure I'm wrong, why are you calling? <laughs> they said, it confirmed. He goes, confirmed. He went to Yale. So the new true directory, I went to Yale. So funny. And Tulane's a great school. Tulane is a great school, but he had this vision of what a university should be. And it right. wasn't somewhere where palm trees grew. <laughs> it was a little campus in the Northeast, like Amherst or Williams. I mean, because he went to NYU when it was a commuter school. And okay. from the movies, like the Andy Hardy movies or whatever, the, uh, what's his name, Booth Tarkington books, he had this idyllic Brooklyn immigrant son version of a New England 
campus, and that's where he wanted one of his kids to go, and none of us did. We let him down. Oh. Well, it, I mean, you have such a such a successful career that I can't imagine that you've let him down at this point. <laughs> I'm sure he's very proud of you. When I had my first book published, and it did really well, Tough Jews did really well, and we were walking in Riverside Park, and I said, where do you see me in 10 years? I was 29, 30. He said, in 10 years, you'll just be about to turn 40. You'll probably just be getting out of law school. So he never gave up on the dream. <laughs> Does he still want you to go to law school? No, now he says I'm over the hump. <laughs> and <I'm okay. laughs> it's too late, too late for me. So now he's working on my kids. Just that's oh, that's so funny. Um, so, so are you working on anything right now? Any books? I'm always or- working on stuff. I mean, I'm working on a book about the NBA in the 1980s. I'm a, sort of a part. I made myself a sports writer at some point even though because I'm a just a giant sports fan and I played sports and my kids play sports. So, and I always thought sports are great to write about because it's all the stuff from life that's hidden is out in the open in sports. There's no hiding. You got to do it in public. That's interesting. So, yeah, that's true. I just remember watching a game where the Dodgers were a pitcher. I don't know if you know about baseball at all, but he pitched a perfect game. I think there were only 27 perfect games in the whole history of baseball. Wow. And like on the last play, somebody got a, somebody got a hit. And he won, but he had to walk off the field uh-huh. after this thing. And it was like, just that walk that he made was so, it seemed like John Wayne walking through a John Ford movie. It was like such a kind of courageous thing not to just break down at the end of the uh, Yeah. I thought yeah. you never get to see that anywhere else. That's the stuff people hide from you. Yeah. You get massive disappointment, career yeah. disappointment yeah. in public. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I want to ask, I want to ask you a few questions that we have from, from, um, people who are listeners and watchers. Have you, uh, this is from somebody on, on my team, actually, have you ever had to handle rejection from publishing companies and how did you do that? So I started my career. I, we would, like I said, you wouldn't call it a career. I started this thing that I'm doing. Uh, I was a receptionist and a messenger at the New Yorker magazine. Yeah. Which got, I got by a total fluke. And I started sending, writing stories and sending them out. And I saved the rejection letters. And I think I have a file with them still. And I think there's over a hundred of them. You know? Wow. So that was another big thing of my father's, which is, so I, this is in the book, but basically when I told him I wanted to be a writer and he wanted me to go to law school, we had a big, big fight. And eventually he backed off. And I thought I have won. Like this is today I'm a man. I've battled him and he backed off. And then about three months later, I started receiving in the mail rejection letters from law schools. I did not apply to. He had applied for me to like 22 law schools. I got into one and I got rejected by the other ones. And I was very angry. And I'm like, you know how, humiliating it is it's like a girl you've never met calling you up and telling you she won't go on a date with you I didn't even, it was horrible 21 of these and he said i am preparing you to be a writer if you want to be a writer the main thing you have to deal with is rejection yeah. you know and i am teaching you so right away I started with a huge amount of rejection and it still happens and it's always disturbing it's always demoralizing and you always get over it yeah, that's true. You do always get out of it. And you know, it puts hair on the chest. Yeah. I mean, it's just part of the thing, which is sometimes you like a lot of what, like the best things you write will have trouble because they are new and people don't know how to understand them and they don't know measure them. They don't fit in any categories or the term I always hear, it falls between stools. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I'll tell you that one of those rejection letters I always remember was because you'd have to send a self-addressed stamped envelope. Uh-huh. And this one, it had a form I got back. And the form had a bunch of boxes. It said, your story's been accepted. That was not Mark. Your story has been rejected and returned in a self-addressed stamped envelope. Not checked. Underneath the person had written, your story has been rejected and recycled. Recycled? <laughs> put the paper in a recycle link. <laughs> put it back. I put it in the recycling bin. Oh, my gosh. That's, that's mean. That's like a, that's a mean thing to write. 
I know. But it was so mean that it was fun. It is. I mean, it is funny. I mean, it's, you know, what after you get over it, it's funny. It's one of those things where it's like too soon. There's a period of time where it's too soon and then it's yeah. funny later. Um, this is from Samantha Weinstein. Which work are you most proud of? Well, I'm always most proud of what I've just done because I have to believe that I'm getting better all the time. I'm improving or like, what's the point? Yeah. I still have the school mentality, which is every year is like another grade and I'm smarter than the year before. Mm-hmm. So I have to believe that the book I just did is the best book I've done. And, and if I ever felt otherwise, and it's at some point, it's going to be otherwise, right? I'm going to age and lose all kinds of brain power and get stupid and slow. <laughs> um, but I, I, so right now, I think the best book I've ever done is this book about my father. But I really think it is because... It's the most important stories to me. It's the most, the person I know the best in the world and uh, touches every part of my life. But so I would say the adventures of Herbie Cohen, world's greatest negotiator. I should say that title, by the way, which sounds kind of nuts. Um, when I was a kid, Playboy Magazine did a big profile of my father. Really? And, and profile and Playboy Magazine was then like the largest circulation magazine and Philip Roth wrote for it and John Updike wrote for it. Norman Mailer wrote it. It was a huge deal. And uh, they put on the cover of Playboy, Herb Cohen, World's Greatest Negotiator. And it was like, I think it convinced him he should write a book because it's like the outside world judging me. And um, so that was just like a phrase we would kind of kid him with. Hey, aren't you the world's greatest negotiator? Can you go in? I want to buy something for my girlfriend. Can you go get me half the price? You're the world's greatest negotiator, aren't you? <laughs> you know? And my and the, my wife would always say, "You're like your father's life is such an adventure." So I was thinking of what calling it, and she said, "The Adventures of Herb Cohen, World's Greatest Negotiator." Almost like it's a comic. Yeah. Movie. And I just love that title. So that's where that's where it came from. It's it it does it has like a superhero element to it. Like the undertone. Yeah, for sure. And that was the thing about my father, which is, and it was probably, I don't know if it was healthy or unhealthy as a kid, but you felt like no matter what happened to you, he could get you out of it if it was bad. He can get you out of any jam. He can come to the rest. And the only danger was he would, he would do too much. He was relentless, right? Was relentless. Yeah. So like my father grew up with Larry King. It was, I wrote about that in the book. Yep. Larry was always in trouble. He always got in trouble. <clears throat> as a kid and as a grown-up, <laughs> my father was always in there getting him out of it. Oh, it was God. like his favorite thing to do. So but that was why that was the title. Love that. And on that note, um, I want to thank you so much for being a guest. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you. I can't wait to read your books. And I, um, I'm going to put the 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 books links to the books in the comments so that people can get them and read them as well. Um, And, you know, I hope, I hope to speak to you again. You're a really interesting person. Your dad's a really interesting person. And um, it was a lot of fun. Well, first of all, thank you. You can talk to him too. Anytime you want, he is around. I would love to. (laughs) Anytime you want to do that, just let me know. And anytime you want to talk to me, I am here. Thank you so much, Rich. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Nice to talk to you. You too. Have a great day. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching and listening to Kelly Minds Her Manners. Make sure to subscribe to the show and don't forget to leave us a review to tell us what you liked about the episode. You can connect with Kelly at Kelly Minds Her Manners on Instagram and TikTok or on our website, www.kellymindshermanners.com. 